so now that's the runaway for Expedia. They're gonna find the first stun. In comes Acadia and the rest of the squad looking for the damage up, but it's close to the dude get the first kill. Now Acadia gonna be running. And double versus Sven! He's gonna turn it around! Oh, and he tossed him with it! A triple kill! Wiggly trying to get himself away with the ultimate, but I do not think it's gonna be enough. Not when you fail the flash. A double kill for the TSM top. Oh, the ultimate! Sven with the flash into the crescendo, and surely Azale. Surely this is it. A triple for Broken Blade, and TSM will continue the win streak. Welcome everyone to Esports in 30. I'm Lisa Dwan and this is Matt Hempstead. And the LCS Summer Split is upon us. Matt, yes. it's a brand new split. Every team had a fresh start going into this week. So what are your thoughts coming out of this week? I mean, it kind of everything just came so fast from MSI. I wasn't really ready for Summer Split. Some teams clearly weren't ready either. Um, obviously, all eyes on some of the roster moves. CLG with Ruin, 100 Thieves with Amazing. Uh, one move looks better than the other right now, though, again, obviously, it's going to take some time to see how they actually adjust to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, again, Team Liquid's the team to beat. Who's going to step up and take them down? Probably nobody. <laughs> um, but in week one, they were vulnerable. Um, so we'll see how, how everyone did. All right. Well, we will get to the LCS in detail a little later. But before that, we've got G2's head coach, Grabs, joining us in just a few. So let's take a look back at their journey to becoming MSI champions. If you have the luxury to move one of the best mid laners in EU history to AD carry to make room for caps, you have too many damn good players. Bad. Perks now, potentially in trouble. Windwall comes out to stop any follow-up on that angle. Perks now pulled back. Knockup is there as well, but they just cannot kill him. They're just going to kill everybody. Trying to get the shutdown goal. Kajal is worth so much money, but look at the burst damage. Oh, caps oh, isn't done yet. Oh. He's got one. He's got two. All right, Patrick has got his flash and his cleanse available. Here comes Alfari. That's at least one level of engage. Cosmic Radius River is still on cooldown, but Alfari so, so low. One, two quick kills for G2. The re-engage from Wanda. He is just destroying Origin. Who in prison, just missing, just going wide. Wanda takes a little bit of damage from Patrick, throwing out the overloads onto the overloads. Alfari They're gets going one. For it. He gets the base. The team, before 20 minutes, is looking for it. G2 Esports are looking at the Nexus. Origin, they're trying to fight back, but they cannot do it. Origin are crumbling to G2. Europe kneels to its champion, G2 Esports. The world awaits, G2. This is the G2 Classic. They never go for conventional and try and end the game. They're split pushing right now. Ryze joins the top side. Here they go. All right, Abyssal Voyage will deliver Teddy to the back line. But Caps and Wonder are on the Nexus. They will not go quietly. The Nexus is being focused. But look at Faker. Nexus, one or two more hits. Many more hits on. Wonder forces game five. Caps is trying to find the kill. Mata's in trouble. Faker's low. But they've already got one into Mata. Where is Teddy? Follow his HP bar. Can't flash up the wall. Teddy's dead. Yankos is in the pit. G2 Esports have been gifted and donated a Baron from SKT. That's a dunk from Wonder. Death from below for the double, for the ace. G2 Esports eliminates SK Telecom. North America face Europe at the MSI Finals. Nice juke by Cap, but will be hit a little bit. Nice little sun comes in. Ult comes in as well. He's got a lot of a playground to play around with. They find that first sun. They find some daily, but Ignite means he will get the solo kill the 1v2. And Caps tries it for Jensen. And here comes Mickey. G2 unwilling to be stopped. The turret's still in their eyes. Feathers fly. And G2 will pull back. That's a big stun. That's a big engage. Oh my gosh, look at the fight. They look for kill number four. This might be an ace inside of the base inside of 18 minutes. This is what peak League of Legends looks like. And it comes from Europe. A world record. G2 Esports 3-0 will win MSI 2019. The team responsible for turning the League of Legends world upside down at MSI was none other than G2 Esports. And we're thrilled to have their head coach, Grabs, joining us. How's it going? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Everything's fine here. <laughs> of course. We're so honored to have you. Uh, now we're a couple of weeks past MSI, and you've had time to absorb your victory over Team Liquid. How does it feel about the fact that you guys are MSI champions now? 
As you said in the press conference after the game, it still feels incomplete because we didn't challenge IG in the best of five. <laughs> um, so it kind of feels nice, of course, BSI champions, but we know for sure we're not the best team in the world yet. Um, but that's something we're working towards, so hopefully during Worlds we can show the world what we can actually do. That's interesting that you guys, like, IG was the one who everyone thought was going to win, and so everyone probably focused on them. Yeah. But does that not, like, the fact that, you know, Team Liquid beat IG, you guys beat Team Liquid, like, does that not validate the win? Why you guys got to, like, take that approach? I mean, it kind of validates it in a, in a sense, but if we're being honest, I think if they play 10 best of fives in over 10 different days, IG wins, like, 8 or 9. Oh. Um, the same way you can argue if you play SKT more, maybe SKT wins more, you know, you never, you never know. Um, so we still think IG is a team to beat, especially because we're zero five against them. So unless we beat them, I think nobody will be satisfied. Yeah, I guess it, it's, being a tough critic is important to, to getting better, right? Always be hungry. Exactly. Uh, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the year because you guys made a pretty bold move when you uh, brought Caps over from Fnatic and you moved Perks to the bot lane. So I want to know, when you heard about this news, what went through your head? Did you immediately start thinking about all the crazy possibilities <laughs> you could possibly come up with with these Who's guys? Whose idea was it, actually? Yeah. Who started, like, whose idea was it to move Perks to bot lane? Um, I think that's something Perks came up with himself. Um, <laughs> he always played AD second role in Solo Queue anyway, so he knew he can be proficient. Uh, when he didn't have the chance to bring Caps and playing with Mickey, I think then it was pretty easy for him to decide, okay, this is something worth exploring. Um, my first thought was I was kind of worried because uh, in a team where you have five playmakers, this can also go uh, backfiring really hard because if everybody wants to carry where the resources, um, I know for a fact from beforehand that Perks, Wanda, and Jengus can go a bit crazy, like mentality-wise and um, personality-wise. So I was worried about how, how they're going to mesh with Mickey and Caps, but all five of them are just the same. Um, really trolley personality, um, but also like high will of winning. So it's a good, a good mesh together. How, how did you guys make it mesh? Because like you said, they're all very like dominant personalities, dominant laners in a way. How did you guys mesh that, make it all work? Um, it was pretty easy, honestly, because we just had a meeting before every every split. Uh, we agreed to certain principles we want to adhere to. Um, so we start the split on the same page. If you win, of course, it's get easier. But in the end, we have an environment where everybody can criticize everybody very openly. And nobody gets any grudges or takes something personal. So we have a very productive environment. And um, everybody is the same in terms of worth. And everybody gets here. Everybody can speak, so therefore it's just a very open um, conversation all the time. I mean, the chemistry really stands out too on the Rift because it doesn't look like there's too many, you know, miscommunications or anything. But one thing that really stands out, especially in the LEC and at MSI, is the creativity that this team has. So where does this creativity stem from? Like, do you go to your team and be like, hey, Wonder, you're going to play Pike Top today? <laughs> or is that something that they bring over to you? No, it's, my role is more about um, oppressing this urge because they all have crazy <laughs> ideas all the time. Um, it doesn't even stop at picks, it starts with lane swapping and oh in this matchup I'm a better Teemo player, I can go mid instead of you and you go support it, okay sure. <laughs> uh, we have to be like, no guys come on, let, let's take our roles first and then we can see. Um, but as I said, with a very open environment, that means everybody can um, participate and can bring their ideas in and if it makes sense and of course we can explore it. But in the beginning everybody has a chance to actually explore their creativity and I think that's an environment they all can thrive in. Interesting. Mm. I think one of the things people wonder about G2, because you guys have so many like surprise picks and strats and stuff, one, do you guys ever feel pressure to always bring something new? Like, or do you guys are able to also play meta and stuff like that, but just choose not to? Like, how do you, how do you balance that? Um, we just create very clear conditions when you want to bring something out. If you think back about the whole funnel thing against Origin in the final, we knew we only play funnel if they bring this certain trilogy in. Mm. Um, same for the pike in the beginning, we had it prepared as a counter to Jace. Um, even though in the end of the, in the tournament we used it as a blind pick as well at some point. Um, we just agreed beforehand when you want to use something, you're not be forced to do it. Um, we just create an environment in a draft that we know that the pick will work mm. and then bring it out because usually other teams might be try something because they think it's strong, but they don't care about bringing the right um, core around it. Then the pick fails and they drop it. But I think we are really good at making sure that we only use those picks in the environment where it makes sense. You mentioned preparing for some of these interesting strats or picks. How much testing do you guys actually put into some of these strategies before you're like, you know what, now we can actually run this and, and see how it does against teams in the actual LEC or MSI? Um, all my players have a lot of experience already. That means they all know how certain matters should go. Um, for example, the funnel thing, we came up, I think, three days before you played. 
Um, we played, I think, four times in scrims only. <laughs> um, then we kind of got it back in the groove, and again, like, I'm blessed with five players who are insanely smart about the game. Um, so most of how we should play just comes in discussions without having to actually play it on stage. Um, also, a big strength for ours is um, problem solving during the game. So even if we fall behind, a team fight goes wrong, um, they are able to fix that during the game because they all just understand the game on a very fundamental level mm -hmm. as compared to other players would. Um, so therefore, it doesn't take much time for this team to adapt to strategies. So it's safe to say you guys have really strong players in all lanes, probably yes. the top European players right now. Um, how much freedom do you have in drafting, game planning, and also balancing everyone else's voices on the team as well? Um, usually how it goes is that I provide the framework. That means all the scouting that Duffman, my analyst or assistant coach, or you want to call it, and me do. Um, we bring in the basic idea. So this is something this team will do. This is how they behave in pick and ban. Um, this is what you can expect them to pick if it's left open. And these are the three first picks you want to go into. Um, then it's the first discussion. Are we happy with those three, uh, first three picks? Are we happy with the matchups? Let's say the Stars Akali trade. Caps can then say, okay, against this certain player, I'm happy doing that. Against this guy, not. Um, then we change the first three picks around. And then usually, especially the picks four and five, um, they know what we want of them or what I expect of them to pick. Let's say if I need a split pusher or a tank or whatever. But in that framework, they have a lot of freedom to explore what they want to do. The only requirement is that we, it's something we need to have discussed beforehand. So they can't just go on stage and say, I think Timo is good here if we have not talked about Timo. Have you guys so. ever had a moment where maybe you guys, in the moment of like drafting, you guys kind of butted heads, a uh, specific moment like that? I would say butt heads, not really, no. Because wow. um, in the end, as I said before, um, in the first three picks, usually I have the last word because it's something we pre-agreed on. But it was something we agreed on before in 4 or 5 that they have the freedom. So, mm. of course, we can ask them, are you sure this is good? Um, but we all trust each other so much to say, yeah, I think this is good in the situation. Let them play. And even if it loses the game, which sometimes happens, um, nobody gets angry because, again, we know um, our team is so insane and we believe in each other. So mistakes happen, right? Yeah. Uh, what can happen though, for example, is that we get too creative in a sense. If you think back about the draft against AG, where we suddenly had faint top, um, we were so preoccupied thinking about our mage bot that we kind of forgot to pick GP early. And then we're like, ah, oh, let's finally pick GP top. AG bent GP, and we're like, yeah, guys, um, this is hard now. And then, <laughs> which is my mistake, right? Because again, I went away from the framework that I had before. Mm. Um, so that's something that I have to basically rein in. Like, even if they tell me that's a good idea, I still need to make sure that their pre-plan goes through, which didn't happen there, and then therefore with being top, lost the game, which is uh, totally on me. You know, a lot of teams, when they're getting ready for a match, like in the pre-game lobby or whatever, it's all serious, and they're just trying to get prepped Focus. and focused yeah. into the game. But with G2, we've heard some interesting things, like they're doing karaoke, they're having fun, they're making jokes. So, I mean, they're memeing, they're confident, they're having fun. How important is this lighthearted temperament to their success and just, you know, having a good time? It is really important. Um, something that I learned about my career as coach, especially like in the first years in Rocket, is that back then I tried to bring in my philosophy and make sure that it goes my way, but you need to realize as a coach, um, you're only there to make the players happy, right? So with this team, it's very clear to see they all thrive in a happy environment. They all want to have fun, and that's what they play the game for. Um, sure, they're still high professional athletes, but they're playing with a smile, so it should be an environment where they can do that. So me being on stage and telling them, okay guys, we, um, shut up now and be more serious wouldn't help at all, right? Um, sure. So it just happens naturally, um, especially guys like Jankos when they got the coffee and the sugar, they were crazy, <laughs> and then this happens on stage all the time. <laughs> Major dad vibes right now, he, he yeah. sounds like a dad. Um, what's interesting is, you know, we've known each other for a bit now, and I remember the times where you were like the coach of Rock Hat, was it like a while back, and now look where you are now. Um, I wanna know like, well, how do you feel like you've grown and how, what these guys have taught you while you were on G2 and maybe what you've taught them? Yeah, I mean, I think I just matured a lot in, a, in my role as a coach. In the beginning in Rocket, I thought I have to be a teacher, which might still be true in lower league teams or lower end teams where players don't have experience, but just realizing um, that my job is not forcing tools in a certain way, but seeing what I have as a team and making sure that they can work the best is something that I learned on G2, especially working with Perks, who's very demanding let's say um so he can't be handful to work with but in the end he wants to win right so it's not my job to make sh to to force him into my scheme but more to adapt to him and make sure okay how can i help perks let's say perform the best and if that's a role i have to be a more of a mediator and less of a of a strategist for example then that's something i have to do 
And um, of course now if I would go back to Rocket, that would be a very different coach. Maybe then he would actually reach players at some point <laughs> of their teams as well. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy how it went for me as well personally. I mean, if you thought he was cocky before, he's going to be extra cocky now that he's an MSI champion. <laughs> and now you have to juggle this going into the <laughs> summer split. Uh, he, so how he, do you... He can't, he can't get more cocky. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> he's already reached the maximum. Yeah, the max. But how do you keep this team focused and how do you keep making improvements uh, going into the LEC summer split now that you've already kind of um, reached international success? You're going back to Europe with, with all of that behind you. Yeah, and not only said, I think there's a big difference in between being cocky and being arrogant. Mm. Um, so I would like to use to say that we are arrogant in a way that we know that if we play our game and we play to our standards, we should win most games. Whereas being cocky would mean we don't respect our opponents. And there's the big issue or like the big, the big um, focus point that we know for a fact if we take any game lightly, we will lose in the LSC. Mm. Even though, of course, the bottom tier teams, even those teams are good enough to take you down if you don't take them seriously. Um, also, just how we played at MSI, um, even though we won, we know we had huge flaws. We, um, let's say SKT and even Team Liquid are, for example, way better at playing on Drakes than us. Um, so just seeing this grounds us, and then we see, okay, this is something we can improve on. As long as we don't do that, we can't call ourselves the best team in the world because there are some huge flaws, right? Um, especially if players like Perks and Caps and Wanda, Jango Sneaky as well. Um, they all honor the craft so much, and they're so perfectionist that they will never think they're the best. So I don't have to do that much and keep the motivation up. It's just a natural thing with these players. That's actually interesting because I was thinking, you know, with G2, you guys have been dominant in Europe for so long. Yep. It's hard to not sometimes get complacent or just expect to be the best in the region, right? So it's interesting you bring up the fact that they are very perfectionist and they're always looking for things to improve on. But do you guys ever fall for that kind of like trap? Like, you know what? EU is easy now. EU is an easy win because we've been dominant for so long. Uh, yeah, it happened. Like, if you look back at last season when we lost the first game against Origin, uh, week six, I believe, um, the draft was a result of us being cocky, in a sense. That we said, yeah, sure, say that we didn't play that much, we'll work. Um, the communication between Caps and um, Perks about what they want to play wasn't the best there because Ball thought, oh, whatever, this matchup I can play. Um, and then we lost, right? Mm. Um, then we realized how quick it can go. So, of course, there's always a danger of that happening especially if in the best of one scenario where we don't prepare that much for your opponents. Um, but we are very aware of that. And we talk about this stuff constantly, like every week we have a meeting about what went wrong, what went right. Um, so I'm not afraid that we actually like um, lose touch with reality at all. Hmm. I mean, I guess everyone in Europe is kind of looking at G2 as a team to be. I guess that's not really anything new either. That You've kind of been dominating for a while. But who do you think is your biggest competition uh, for the Summer Split Trophy? I know Origin was kind of that team that was always uh, funny you in the finals uh, in spring. But you think it's going to be the same thing in Summer or you'll get a different team? Um, I think it's really hard to say now because there's still like 10 weeks until playoffs mm. because of the first rivals and yeah. the break. Um, especially in a best of one setting. Um, Everybody can beat anybody, and if people would know how we scrim, then I wouldn't be surprised to lose like six, seven games, you know, because that's just how we play in best of ones. Um, I think Origin has a really good fundamental understanding of the game, so they will always be good. Um, a team like Fnatic, I mean, they're still the world's finalist team with a different mid laner, so in yeah. theory they should be good, right, even though they only have shown towards the end of last split. Um, so I expect those two teams again to be really strong. Um, I'm looking forward to how Rogue will perform because now I think they have a better roster and I don't foresee them being 10th place um, as long as they don't royally um, bleep the bad. <laughs> not sure how much nice swear, yeah. um, so that's something I look forward to, but besides that, I don't think there will be much surprise. Um, so yeah, I think Fnatic and Origin are going to be the uh, bigger contenders. Interesting. All right. Well, looking forward, I know it's probably too far to look ahead. But going into the season, are you guys already kind of thinking like Worlds? Like is Worlds in your mind at all? Or are you guys just focusing on the season? Uh, we take it um, step by step. So we think about how we want to approach the split. Um, with a discussion like two hours ago, what our goal should be. Um, three players instantly set 18 and zero. Um, so yeah, that will be the first goal, which we're probably <laughs> not going to meet because at some point I'm going to interdraft and then we're going to lose the game. <laughs> um, so yeah, first step would be securing the quarterfinal buy, that means for the second place, then winning the title, and then doing good at Worlds, right? Um, so as I said before, like we know, LSC is not that easy, and if you think too much about Worlds, we're gonna lose and not get there at some point, maybe even. Um, so we're not gonna um, take it lightly, the LSC. 
Wow. One step at a time. Grabs, you have changed. You've grown so much. You're so reasonable <laughs> and level-headed now. What do so, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, lots of stories there. Um, Grabs, congratulations so much for being currently the best team in the world. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you for joining us today, and best of luck in summer. Thanks for having me, guys. Lisa, one thing I want to touch on before we move what? on. You mentioned that he changed. What exactly are you referencing here? Listen, I can't tell secrets. <laughs> uh, honestly, it's, not, it's nothing huge. It's just the fact that, you know, I've known him a couple of years now. And he was, you know when you're, like, new in the scene, you're a new coach, you're, like, young blood, you're, like, really fired up. But yeah. now he just seems so level-headed and mature. And I'm just, it's so awesome to see a friend grow. And now he's, like, the top coach in EU. So yeah. it's so nice to see. I'm sure you've changed a little bit too, but I guess you're not the top uh, coach. No, either. I was yeah. always perfect as I am now. All right, <laughs> well, the LEC hasn't started yet, but the LCS just wrapped up week one of the summer split, so let's check out some highlights from the opening weekend. Working away with that one. TP is canceled now. That's the runaway for Xpedia. They're gonna find the first stun. In comes Acadia and the rest of the squad. Looking for the damage up, but it's close, but they do get the first kill. Now Acadia gonna be running. And double it versus Sven! He's gonna turn it around! Oh! And he tossed him with it. A triple kill! But they're losing turrets. They're losing structures. A stun towards the back line. Acadia's down. They'll find Smoothie as well. Team Liquid, five on three. They will absolutely shatter the base. And a sub 30 minute win in a rematch. The finals team Liquid pick up where they left off, beating TSM and being number one in the LCS as a few more kills come in and a slaughter on the rift for Team Liquid. Wiggly's nearby, does have Volt, pops it, gets the first stun. Here comes the rest of it, they're gonna have it. Might have found their opening, looking for the play. Big hole for Saligo, does find one flash of the walls. Wiggly's gonna stay alive, and now the re-engage is beautiful. They find that crit. No way, Rumble he gets hole. to make the play. So the flash in for Rune, they try to burn him down, and they will do so. The spike should begin, and it is. Another kill picked up, and now Rune's gotta be a bit careful. He needs the reinforcements, and they are now here, looking for a Sunday, and this is a flashless rumble. He will die to the shockwave, and CLG find three kills, plus the Baron. Oh, and they're still not fighting for their own structures. They're just simply walking back and letting it all fall. Still a bit directionless. A single knockout, but it means nothing. Ruin in the back line. Someday tries for one. They only get a single kill in the fountain. It is CLG walking all over 100 Thieves. Still an extra BF sword up over his opponent. A solo is going to be in some trouble now. Thrown up into the air. Going to be beaten. Down. Oh. Solo gets himself a return kill, though. Jensen goes forward, looking to start this fight off. Rush now, gonna be the one who jumped on Douglas, getting himself away, finding those feathers back. But he is shut down by Yusui. Impact looking to pick somebody up off to the side. They're able to take down Rush. But now Impact likely gonna fall here now as well. And Echo Fox has found themselves a fight. Damage on the Impact here. Hawko gonna be making his way into the fight. And Core JJ again will not find the initiation he's looking for. Impact is already dead. Smith gonna be taken very low. He goes in a rampage, grabbing the kill onto Hawko. Devil's gonna be kept alive into the back line. Plus Still looking to grab the damage onto the TL backside yet again, and they're able to find it. Echo Fox will ace Team Liquid. Echo Fox will take down the LCS champions. Uh, but not going to be able to cash in on it. And six day of our frost might get a kill here. Oh boy, the damage is true. Yerkson, ulti pop to keep him alive. Resurrection's going to come through. CLG needs to time oh. the CC right in the chain. Of corruption. 200 to zero. Biofrost with one combo, and they're looking. Biofrost had to flash away from that, but Cosmic Radiance is going to be keeping Grig alive. He's rooted up, being bursted down. There comes your ultimate from Bjergsen. Biofrost is going to be killed. They're going to lose Broken Blade for it, but he's able to find two. Wiggly trying to get himself away with the ultimate, but I do not think it's going to be enough. Not when you fail the flash. A double kill for the TSM top. Oh, the ultimate with the flash into the crescendo, and surely Azale. Surely this is it. A triple for Broken Blade. Griggs going golden just for the hell of it. Why not? And TSM will continue the win streak.
new split is upon us, but some things never change. CLG lose once again at TSM, <sighs> but despite the loss, CLG actually looked pretty decent in week one. So are they on the up, or is this just false hope? <laughs> just touching on the CLG losing the TSM thing, I think it's been like over a thousand days since CLG's last victory over TSM, which is a little a little sad. But but yeah, I do think CLG is looking up a little bit. I mean, they brought in Ruin, and it already looks like they're kind of playing to his strength. They put him on some some champions that he can carry with Kennen and Rumble, and they give him a lot of help early on. So I think they're kind of just trying to integrate him into a team. Um, and I mean, you can just kind of plug and play a top laner in, right? It's not like you're right. changing up a whole other system. You just put Ruin up top, help him out a little bit, and, and it's going to be okay. So I do think CLG looks pretty good off the top. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had some weird situations um, <laughs> where, I mean, Biofrost was just kind of dying and getting slapped by Dang. Tarek against TSM. <laughs> but, you know, it's whatever. Uh, I, do think, I do think they're going to be better than in spring. Okay, um, one of CLG's opponents was 100 Thieves, oh and boy. they added amazing. Oh boy, that's oh right, boy. they went 0-2 uh, in their first week. Yeah. So uh, what are you feeling about this team, Matt? <laughs> so I, I kind of alluded to it, right? I, I was saying, you, you know, with top laners, you can just kind of put someone in, and it'll be fine. But for the 100 Thieves, they're, they're changing over a jungler, which kind of affects the entire communication system. Amazing's going to also be a part of the shot calling system. So that's going to be a, a huge adjustment period, yeah. too. They only had one off-season, and, you know, limited scrim time, of course, because even teams like Team Liquid probably just started scrimming a week before right. they came back. So for them, it's going to take some time. And it's understandable they went 0-2. Obviously, it wasn't against the like, top tier competition, which is the main mm -hmm. concern. But it, it, I think they need a bit more time to actually get going. Don't read too much into the You know what I heard, though? Amazing actually just came from the airport straight to the studio to play. So they, yeah. they literally had no time to settle in. So maybe it's too early to tell with the 100 Thieves. Uh, moving on, let's talk about Team Liquid. Because Team Liquid crushed TSM in their opener, but then they stumbled against Echo Fox. So uh, do of you think course. TL, of course, uh, are feeling a little maybe like MSI hungover? Like they're not completely on form yet? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, even G2, our grab spoke about it a little bit. He was saying, you know, we're taking bit of an extended break because we spent all that time at MSI. Other teams get to take more time off. We need to give our players a bit more time to relax and get ready for summer. So yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's understandable. They probably prepped more for TSM and we're like, you know what? Echo this Fox, is the one that matters. Yeah, it, it's okay what happens to Echo Fox. And you can kind of yeah. see mid-game, they got a little complacent. Uh, I mean, they, they let a kill go to solo because they tried to give a kill over to someone else. Mm. And then it just kind of started steamrolling a little bit. Um, but again, it's Team Liquid. They'll be fine. They took down IG at MSI. This is a good team we're talking about. Just give them time to get back into the groove, and, and they're going to be okay. Switching sides over to TSM, do you feel like in the match against Team Liquid, they seemed a little like shaky, a little lost? They were very lost. It, right? was, it was totally weird to just kind of watch them fumble around and didn't have a, much direction. Uh, in draft, they got a really good duo in the Aurelia and Sejuani, which is like mm. a power duo because the double melee just helps Sejuani get her proc off and basically the opponent can't move for a long time. Yeah. But instead of targeting that in the top lane, uh, Akadian never really went up there and didn't babysit that lane mm. and take advantage of that duo. And it just they seemed a little lost. Maybe it was, you know, Oh, they've been splitting time with Greg Akadian. Yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe that affects it. Um, but still, that probably should have been their priority and they spent it elsewhere on the map. Do you like the idea, just quickly, about like the whole Akadian Greg uh, balancing, how they're going back and forth with them? I do. I do think it's a good idea. It gives, gives them a little bit lo a different look. You already saw in week one with Greg, they went to Hecarim and kind of funneled everything into him as another Sona Terra composition. And for Akadian, he was on Sejuani. So mm -hmm. Greg definitely had more fun uh, yeah. <laughs> this week in week one. But I, I, I do think after a while, we're going to see them kind of settle in on someone. Obviously, mm -hmm. As you get closer to, you know, Worlds and the finals, you're going to go with who performs the best. Yeah. And after week one, that's Grig. And week two, it could be totally different. There's time. Uh, it's still early. But yeah, I, I do think they'll settle on someone eventually. All right, so now that week one is over, uh, who impressed you the most? Which team impressed you the most? Um, so there's only three teams I went 2-0. Uh, <laughs> yes. Cloud9, Golden Guardians, and Optic. I do think I'm going to give it to Golden Guardians uh, right off the bat. A lot of people are kind of looking at this team to take another step up. Uh, wow. They made playoffs in their in the spring split. And, I mean, we already saw Frog and Pelota Nivea. Uh, no surprise, I <laughs> no guess. No surprise. We should all get used to that. It's an like obligation this point. at this point. He has to play a Nivea at one point during the split. Yes, it has to be done. <laughs> and we got out of the way, so now, now we just get to play whatever he wants. Um, but, I mean, they played against FlatQuest. They pulled out a, a pike top. Everyone's trying to be G2 now. And Golden Guardians weren't phased at all. Uh, so they just swept it aside. And they looked pretty solid. And even in their second game, they had, like, one kill at 25 minutes. And they showed uh, more methodical game style, less reliant on kills, and just kind of showed off their macro a little bit. So mm -hmm. I was impressed by that, even though it was a snooze fest. But. Okay, uh, now we got to talk player of the week. So who are you going to give it to? 
I think I'm gonna give it to someone on Optic Gaming. I know this isn't. This is probably never gonna happen what? ever again, ever again. But I'm gonna <laughs> give it to Crown, um, I, someone who came over from Korea. Obviously, he's a world champion. He's yeah. got a lot of uh, prowess. But he played Twisted Fate in his first game, and you know they were kind of down and out in that game. And some of his his flanks and his teleports really just turned the whole game around. So I was pretty impressed by that. And then also he pulled out Vladimir in the second game of the week. Um, really turned some team fights around as well. So. Huge shout out to Crown and Optic Gaming for going 2-0 in their opening week. Again, it wasn't the toughest competition early on, right. but still, you, you need to take advantage of those Lord teams in the standings sure. and start 2-0. It's looking good for Optic. For sure. Wow, it's a whole new season, I huh? Know. For Everything's Optic starting fresh. All right, well, that is it. It's amazing uh, to have the LCS back and the LEC summer split is just around yes. the corner. Tomorrow, AJ Fry and Ron Lee are previewing stage three of the Overwatch League, so make sure to tune in. Until then, you can hit us up on our socials at Squad State, and we'll see you all tomorrow.